welcome back. It's week 37 on Out on That Line. I'm Jeff with my co-host Alex. As always, Alex, how are you this week, buddy? <laughs> We're just chilling today, Jeff. We're just chilling here on the podcast. Yes, we are. Yes, we are. Yeah, chilling indeed. Uh, we, we failed to come up with a solid idea for an opening segment here, but we do have two albums for you this week, so we're going to make up for it. Uh, you know, we don't have a get to know your co-host. We're out of co-hosts for that game. We were in, we're fresh out, so we can't do that one again. Uh, but we do have the BB Rexa album, Better Mistakes, that just came out, as well as the J. Cole album, The Off Season. Uh, highly anticipated album from J. Cole, this one. Um, he, he's been pumping it up for a while, and I think a lot of folks have been really excited. I personally have never really gotten that big into J. Cole. Always enjoyed him when I heard him, but was never at the level of like DMX or Jay-Z for me or anything like that. So I was I was looking forward to this one and didn't disappoint, spoiler alert. Um, and we also did, like I said, the BB Rexa album, Better Mistakes. And I certainly had never listened to any of her solo stuff. Um, I'd heard like some songs she did with people like Calvin Harris or something like that. She used to like kind of feature on those like dance tracks and stuff. Uh, but that's really all I knew about her. So this was a really uh, fresh experience for me all the way through this week. Yeah, I mean, it was virgin territory for me, too. I couldn't name you one BB Rexa or J. Cole song, even though I'm sure I've heard both. So um, mm -hmm. this really kind of was a, a total a week of just blind shithouse luck. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to have some interesting things to talk about. I think one of the albums you're going to find out we liked a little more than the other. Um, but overall, not a totally disappointing experience with either of them which is always nice yeah so for lack of an opening segment should we just jump in on the bb let's do it we'll, okay. we'll jump right into bb rexa better mistakes um so for this one because i think we realized we weren't going to really come up with something strong for the opening segment we each chose two songs from each album so we're going to have eight in total to go over today um starting with the opening track on Better Mistakes called Break My Heart Myself. And this is one she did with Travis Barker of Blink-182 fame. And he seems to do everything but make his own music nowadays. Yeah, and there again, this is perhaps sacrilege, but I was never a super duper like Blink-182 fan. Like I know, I know the biggies and Take Off Your Pants and Jacket was weirdly the album I listened to the most because it came mm -hmm. out at that point where it was like you're you're starting to think about rebelling and then you listen to a hidden track that's talks about like it's labor day and my grandpa just ate seven fucking hot dogs and he shit his pants you're in sixth <laughs> grade you're like i hope i didn't just peak listening to that yeah that was uh really uh really interesting music for you know 14 15 year olds i don't know how well they aged um i'm sure a lot of folks think they aged pretty well but, you know, I never got into them that much either. You know, yeah. it was very, very surface level interest that I had in them. I was much more into like Sum 41, Lucky Boy's Confusion, Coheed and Cambria. You know, yeah. I was much, much more into some other bands that were in that kind of rock and roll, pop rock, emo kind of sphere, you know. Um, it's it's really, for me, Blink-182 just never really did it for me. Like musician-wise, musicianship was always fine, but... Yeah. The subject matter just never really jived for me. Dude, people will spill blood for Blink-182. Like, mm -hmm. it, it brings a little, like, comfort to me that you don't really enjoy them either. I'm like, oh, my God, I'm not alone in the apocalypse here. But, like, I mean, there was – there's literally Laser Dad, the 90s cover band that our yeah. friends are in. They had a show, and their opener was Pink 802, and it is a mm -hmm. all-female Blink-182 tribute band which seems awful niche when you drill yeah. down to it. <laughs> but then again, everybody f and their mother fucking loves Blink-182. Yeah, I mean, there's there's a place for everything, and everything goes in its place, I suppose. Like, it's just, uh, it, it's really, um, I don't know. I, I feel like Blink-182 was, was talented, but the fact that they blew up the way they did is just one of those lucky happenstances that you know i'm happy for him like i don't think i dislike anybody in the band but you know just is what it is yeah exactly it's it's no harm no foul yeah and without tom delonge would we even know that we have aliens right now yes jeff because joe rogan would be there to tell you what to think and how to feel oh that's true that's true i forgot about that our our uh our compatriot and podcast joe rogan 
Yep, fellow Texan now too. You're welcome. Yeah, that, I'm glad to have him. I I'm glad he finally responded to my letters and moved to Texas. So tremendous for all of you. Yeah, I really uh it's it's you know, I don't have a lot of moments where I can feel really proud of myself, but that's definitely one of them. Oh, amen, Jeff. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> well, back to what we came here for. Uh break my heart myself. So I thought it was interesting and I kind of wanted to open this one up to a little bit of a broader discussion. I guess we already have, um, (laughs) but about the state of celebrity mental health. So Mm -hmm. if folks remember, you know, late nineties, early two thousands, we had all these artists that would go to the hospital for exhaustion was the, the, the term du jour for mental breakdowns basically was just exhaustion. And now we have a song where, you know, BB Rexa is talking about specific medications that she has taken to combat her mental illnesses and the breakdowns that she's had, like really wide open talking about this stuff in pop music, which is not something that we heard before. It was always swept under the rug. It was always like, these people are perfect. You know, they're, they don't have any problems in their lives, but now we get artists like this and Demi Lovato and just I'm sure there's a host of other artists you know J. Cole even does it where they just express that vulnerability in music that wasn't able to happen you know 15 20 years ago I just thought it was interesting and I don't know why I thought of it this way but as soon as I heard the song I was like huh pop artists do that now and there was a time when they could not do that yeah and and I'm not trying to be cynical when I say this and it's with all due respect to everyone's respective issues but being candid about your mental health struggles is the new put up a facade and pretend like nothing's wrong. You know what I mean? And I, I don't mean that as like there's pressure to make up a mental illness or like, hey, are you sure you don't have schizoaffective disorder? We could move so many albums if you did. Like, I don't even think of it in a crass way, but it's it's become, like you said, much, much, much more visible and Mm -hmm. is just like one further step, along with the advent of stuff like social media, from breaking down the the wall between performer and consumer. So you're right. It's it's interesting to look at this album in that context and the J. Cole one, which I also looked at in like a different like racial and socioeconomic way as well. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just the stuff you get with the privilege of never having listened to either of these artists. Yeah, and and I really, I mean, the song was fine. Like, I really, I I feel like I felt that way about most of the songs on this album. I was like, (laughs) it's fine. You know, I I felt like the things that it opened up to talk about were a lot more interesting than than the music itself. You know, she's definitely got a a hell of a voice. That girl can sing. Like, there's no doubt about that. She's got a great, you know, there's a lot of great melodies on here. But it was not groundbreaking musically by any means and but i think the subject matter was pretty interesting you know that that this is the state of music nowadays is that this is perfectly accepted and encouraged and i think i i like it i mean i think it's if people have these struggles you should be able to write about that as an artist the idea is to express yourself so that you don't internalize all these things and you get an opportunity to you know kind of put them out and help other people as well and you know, she might be kind of glib at some points with with how her reactions to things and how she talks about it. But I guess that's her prerogative and it's better than not saying anything at all about that stuff, you know? Yeah. And to your point, if the subject matter didn't touch on mental illness and mental health, um, this would be just like an absolute popcorn fart because mm-hmm. the music is utterly generic. And you say she's got a good voice. I tend to disagree. I think she can be okay. loud and on pitch, and I find nothing interesting about her voice, which is unfortunate because she writes her music. I'm not trying to shit on her, but everything about this music, unfortunately, is pretty fucking generic. It's inoffensive, yeah. but it wasn't like Dua Lipa, which is very, very mainstream, but at the same time, I found a lot to love in it musically yeah. and i i think she's got an interesting voice but like bb rexa i now understand why i hadn't really heard from her or about her up to this point because i'm just like she reminds me of uh ann in arrested development <laughs> george michael's girlfriend that's just like sitting in a chair and someone will sit on her because they don't see her there like 
That's yep. BB Rexa to me, unfortunately. Sorry, it sounds like a huge slam, and maybe in some ways it is. I don't mean it as such. It's just my observation. Yeah, I mean that's fair, and that's. I mean, I don't. I really don't think you're you're bashing it. Like, you know, you've heard. If you want to go back, folks, and listen to some episodes where we bash things, listen to the Foo Fighters episode as well as either of the Taylor Swift episodes. And you will hear us light some stuff up, even the 1975. People forget about the 1975. I have not. No. You know, if you want to hear us bash something, you go back and listen to those episodes. You'll hear us really tear into them. Like, I've got really nothing bad to say about B.B. Rexa. And you being, you know, a you know, classically trained singer, you're going to have a lot better ear for that kind of stuff. So, if, you know, to me, it was interesting just because it was like, I guess I was just like mowing the lawn. And I was like, got ah, bopping along. I was like, this is not too bad. Mm-hmm. Nothing really grabbed me. But... You know, I guess as far as you can probably recognize real techniques and things like that and the lack thereof, I guess, in this case. And I think, you know, for the for the layman, probably people like me as for listening to it, you're probably going to find it more interesting. But if you really love music and you've studied music and you have trained in music like you have, I could see where where it falls pretty short for you. And it's it's more a, a, a taste thing than a technique thing, because I just it's what I like and what I don't like. I can listen to, I don't like Bob Dylan's voice. I love Tom Waits voice. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it's just, it's weird kind of shit. Captain Beefheart. I really enjoy his voice. Oh, you know who Captain Beefheart was friends with? Let's just get this out of the way. Frank Zappa. (laughs) Um, Do not enjoy Frank Zappa's voice. I liked when he brought in hired guns to sing. I happen to enjoy Donald Fagan's voice of Steely Dan. He hates his own voice. The first album can't buy a thrill. They had a different vocalist. I happen to really like his sound, and I think it's integral to the Steely Dan aesthetic. So I, I'm all over the fucking place, and BB just... BB, you beautiful babe. You just didn't make the cut this time. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear that Donald Fagan hates his voice. At least he and I can agree on something. I shouldn't have told you that. <laughs> you put that one on a tee for me, baby. Fuck! <laughs> so the next song that uh, that you had chosen is Sacrifice. And what was it? What was it about this one? Because we know it wasn't the voice. I think this one for me crystallized what is and isn't her wheelhouse. Mm-hmm. This is a super recognizable Euro dance house beat. It's where mm-hmm. she feels the most comfortable and the most natural. Unfortunately, it's again a generic sound that had its day in like two thousand and two. Mm-hmm. But. You know, sometimes a true classic never goes out of style, if you want to think about it that way. Um, and then thematically, it's it's a kind of a plea for validation and an acknowledgement of one's worth, which, again, manic depression. There's those swings where at a certain point you'll feel like you're a god, and then on the other you think you deserve to go to hell. So it's one of those songs that kind of encapsulates the balance between that mindset. So, again... That kind of pulled this out of the fire because otherwise I'm like, what, you know, European discotheque track from 2005 was this? <laughs> and I I felt like the same thing. I literally wrote down, felt like I was in the early 2000s or late 90s <laughs> listening to like Cascada and Darude. Oh, God. Right. I mean, that's it's it's I don't know, I guess. If you look at it as a good thing that they absolutely got the message across with this music, if that's the sound they were going for, they nailed it because we both went immediately to the same thing. But if they're looking at if they were trying to break some new ground, you know, I guess on that side of the coin, it would be a failure. So it depends on, I guess, what their motivation for making the song was, whether it was successful or not. Um, I'm sure it would depend on who they're talking to. (laughs) <laughs> is, is what what they which one they say it is um but i mean again it was like it was fine it was fine yeah it was not like the worst thing i've ever heard you know it's not a song i'd be pissed off if it just was playing in the background somewhere but it's like again it was another one on an album full of songs it was just like eh, it was fine i guess yeah i i feel bad i'm just like thumping on bb rexa and i really don't it's it's nothing personal but i mean even though the subject matter like slightly saved this one slightly it's still like you said it's it's not the worst thing you've ever heard but it's something we've heard before and i i choose to believe 
that it was homage rather than just you know a Rip Van Winkle situation. The producer woke up and was like, "I've got a great idea for a new sound." <laughs> and so finally came down off that Molly from the from two thousand two. Yeah, right. Like, oh my God, you guys are never gonna you're never gonna believe what I came up with. I came back with so many insights. <laughs> what do you guys think of the Charleston? Like, I choose to believe that it was intentional homage because the alternative is someone is just not creative enough or behind the times enough to deliver this. And I don't want to feel that way. So I don't. And to quote another Arrested Development character, I don't understand the question and I won't respond to it. <laughs> Excellent. Well, the next song, I'm actually very surprised that you did not pick this one because I was going to not choose this one because I was like, well, there's no way Alex is not going to pick this song. So I better find two other ones. But then you sent me your two and this wasn't one of them. Baby, I'm jealous featuring the cat, the cat, Doja cat, my girl. And it's the only reason I picked this one was because it's Doja cat and we are pro Doja podcast. We're pro Doja. Yes, correct. Here's why I didn't pick it, because I had a the, the, my other pick that comes later. Mm -hmm. I had to talk about it, and you'll see why. <laughs> so I I had two picks locked up, and I wanted to do sacrifice because again I think it was the crystallization of where is she most comfortable? Yet why is that a liability? Plus it was a single, so I'm like the hat trick right there. So. Yeah. I didn't have much wiggle room, and I knew that there was a strong chance, north of 90%, that you would pick Baby I'm Jealous. So I placed my faith in you, Jeff, and my faith was not misplaced. <laughs> well, I don't know. <coughs> I don't know if uh, it's a good or a bad thing that I'm as predictable as BB Rexa. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, you know, it's got, like, interesting language, I guess. It It's... You know, she says, this is me, a woman in dichotomy. I love me until I don't. And it sounds like you hear that, right? And it sounds like, aha, oh, that's clever. But then you really, like, listen to it in the context of the rest of the album. And you're like, there's really not a lot going on there songwriting-wise. Like, it's just very bleh, you know? And, and I really, I don't, I, we're ending up bashing her. And, like, I really don't want to do I know, that. Because I, I, know. Don't, I really didn't hate the album at all. But it's just, like, I can't. I, on the other hand, I just can't find that much to get really excited about on it. Especially this one, all the things you just pointed out, it's very Taylor Swifty. It's very yeah. Taylor Swifty, like fake deep stuff. And I don't, I don't fuck with that. And another issue I had with this song, weirdly enough, I don't know why I'm leading off with this, but I have this weird thing about songs that date themselves by mentioning something like, twitter or instagram or the timeline or tiktok or something mm -hmm. like that but then when i really think about it i'm like well you know there are songs that mentioned the television and there was a point where that was a new invention and the 1930s version of me would probably be offended to hear it making its way into your music because we tend to think of music very nostalgically mm -hmm. we, we form these attachments to these songs and these albums and these people so I guess I, it's just an irrational, like, lyrical decision hatred that I need to get over. But the whole premise of this song is she caught her man liking other women's shit on Instagram, and it's making her insecure. So unfortunately, there's nowhere for me to run and hide with this song. Yeah, they, don't, they didn't leave a lot of wiggle room with this one. Um, it's, <laughs> I do like that Doja Cat somehow rhymed boys with fire yeah uh, just like cleverly saying like some girls want boys tell lies until they bug it and they pants on fire like in the way she said it you know i didn't i didn't do a good job there but the way she said it it definitely rhymed i'm like how do you even like you had to just like not want to think about coming up with alternative words that do rhyme that get the same message across you're just like ah eh, i'll just kind of mumble this one and it'll, it'll work out yeah that's a classic <laughs> elvis costello just <laughs> bend the word to your will if it can't fit you make it yeah and i i will say i do always enjoy hearing doja cat's verses whether it's this song or any other i think she's got just a very interesting voice she's got a very interesting way that she kind of 
puts together her verses. So that part, at least to me, I mean, honestly, I think it was like the best part of the album for me was her specific verse on this one. Definitely. She's so fucking weird. She's just such a weird chick. I mean, again, not to be regressive, but oh my God, like the one, (laughs) what a, what a lovely woman. And (laughs) like, yeah, she's really good at what she does as well. So like, it's just, I don't know. I have a huge, I can't even be funny about it. I have a massive crush crush on Doja Cat. Like, yeah. Oh my God, dude. That's fair enough. That's, that's uh, not, not misplaced. That's for sure. I'm like a night wolf. (laughs) <laughs> well what do you say we wrap this baby up yes with amore featuring the corrections officer extraordinaire ricky rose <laughs> rick ross what the fuck was this song <laughs> what the fuck was this fucking song so we all we all know when the moon hits your eye like a big pizza pie, that's a more. <laughs> it's not a fucking good song. It is a meme at this point. <laughs> Why this one? Why would you take this one? And again, you can take it if you're going to make fun of it or turn it into something entirely new. There's a song by a group called Daz Racist. Don't worry, they're not racist. Um, they are people of color. Um but they have a song, and I, uh, it's called You Oughta Know, and they take um, Moving Out, and they take that You Oughta Know, mm-hmm. but you should never argue with a crazy man, 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 and they, they chop and screw it and turn it into a new beat for their song. Yeah. And it's really cool, and it's really interesting. She didn't fucking do that here. She just nope. took That's Amore and put a bunch of lyrics about materialism in it. I don't yep. understand, Jeff. I don't understand. <laughs> See, I thought this one, and not because I thought this one was like one of the, other than the Doja Cat verse, this was probably like the most interesting thing on the album because, not because I liked it, because I was listening to it. I was like, you got to be fucking kidding me. Like, yeah. <laughs> when, <laughs> when you wake in a dream wrapped in Versace sheets, that's Samore. Like, that's her. That's what we're talking about here. When you rip off his clothes in his all black Luso, that's Amore. Like, it's bad. It's really, really bad. And not even Ricky Rose can save this one. But she says, I need diamonds the size of an island. I deserve everything you can buy me. Spend it on me. Oh. And I just could not believe every single line was worse than the last. As far as I was like, how much more materialistic can this song get? in an album full of things about like mental health and not being confident in yourself. And then all of a sudden, like wham, bam, we're talking about spending money on frivolous things and like doing things to impress other people. when you've spent a whole album talking about how you don't care about that. And it just like did not fit, did not compute for me. Well, here's the other thing. The one person she's trying to impress is her father because this is his favorite (laughs) song. And I, I I read a little behind the scenes. This was her dad's favorite song, and he used to walk around the house singing it shittily, as she says. So, okay, your dad used to bellow a shitty, stupid song as he waltzed around doing yard work, and you thought, hey, that would make a good song on an album in 2021. <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't dunking on BB before, but I forgot how mad this song made me. Yeah, I mean it's a classic Rick Ross verse too. Like if you ever, I don't know if you've ever listened to to Rick Ross at all. Um, I I've listened to Rick Ross pretty extensively, and this is par for the course. You know, talking about money, cars, and girls. Like that's what he that's what he does. That's Rick Ross for you, Ricky Rose. And and how fitting because he definitely yeah. sounds like I'm here for the paycheck. Then it's back home. I might get yeah. Burger King on the way home. Like, yeah, he probably already had this verse written. You know, he's like, oh, I'll just use this one I was going to use for a different song, but I've already got it done, so I just need, like, 30 minutes in the studio. I'll be out. I mean, I was waiting. You could get, like, a young, rip-snorting rapper mm-hmm. and get them to do, like, a fucking fire and brimstone verse on something like this, a really aggressive version of what we got, because Rick Ross just kind of signs, like, let's make this quick. I've got a tea time at two. Yeah, <laughs> I was just. He probably did. Ugh. 
he probably did. Yeah, I really, I don't know. This was, and this was the album. No, this was not the album closer. She had one more after this one called Mama, which was maybe the worst of the bunch. So we don't need to, we don't need to go over that one. But well, she she ended the album with two songs in a row that rip off existing songs. Yeah, that's Amore and Bohemian Rhapsody. Yeah, what the hell are you doing? Well, she clearly just ran out of steam, you know. Apparently. Is that an yeah. option on the podcast? If I get, like, too tired, can I just quote other podcasts? If you can come up with an entire episode where you just quote other podcasts and and make it be, like, at least somewhat relevant to what we're talking about, absolutely. That's fine. In fact, I think that takes more creativity than what we do in the first place. Challenge accepted. <laughs> I've created a monster. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I'm going to, I don't know, I guess I'm going to say skip it on this album. And I really, I feel like we bashed her a lot, but I, if you're into this kind of music, you're probably going to love it. But, you know, there's, there's not much here for me. Well, yeah, to the people that like that kind of thing, that's the kind of thing people like. But I, again, it's nothing personal, BB. You seem nice. You seem interesting real easy on the eyes i hate to hammer that every time but <laughs> i you had a whole song about insecurity allow me to tell you <laughs> noted slob me thinks you're beautiful <laughs> i i it's nothing against her personally it's just this album existed i was not underwhelmed i wasn't overwhelmed i was whelmed and that yeah. is probably the most damning thing you can say for a piece of art yep Yep. So, uh, yeah, I guess a, a skip it, not a strong skip it, but for me and probably most listeners of this podcast, likely a skip it. Yeah, don't bother. Yeah. So now we can get into something that I think we can all get a little excited about is the new J. Cole, apparently his sixth studio album. So I know you did some some research, some some deep dive on the old interwebs. So if you wouldn't mind giving us kind of a, a little rundown on what you found out. Well, what I found out isn't necessarily statistical stuff. Like, this is his sixth album, and, and two of them went platinum. I don't, like, have mm -hmm. any of that. Yeah. I was just trying to understand the context of the album, and this is pretty much going to bring us uh, right into the, the first song that we're going to cover, which is my pick, Punch in the Clock. Mm -hmm. um, so it's it's a song on its face that is kind of the thesis statement of the album, which is uh, the the off season. Theoretically, in sports, we're talking here. The off season is when the real work gets done, mm -hmm. and I think about that in the context of the Last Dance, the Michael Jordan and the Bulls documentary. Yeah. Um, when he's coming back, when MJ is coming back from baseball, and it's like you got to rebuild your basketball body. He's doing Space Jam. He's bringing in, like, all these guys are just flying in for pickup games, like, in between workouts and being on the set and stuff. And it's just playing against the best to get sharp for the off – or to get sharp yeah. for the season. The off season is where the hard work takes place. And that's a really, really interesting concept for an album. It puts you in the mindset of, so he's going away. He's generating all this material. We don't see that. He presents all of that to us at once. He originally wasn't going to release any singles either, but he ended up dropping one, and I forget which one it was. I think it might have been Interlude. Yeah, um, it was. Look at me go. <laughs> um, yeah, so anyway, to, to wrap up a big blather, essentially I was trying to figure out who J. Cole was and what he had been through because this song that starts off about work ethic – kind of turns into this really vivid realistic story about like a little kid and like gangsters give him a gun and tell him to shoot it and the recoil is really strong and the bullet whizzes through the trees and he speculates that maybe he accidentally shot someone and the police mm -hmm. arrest him and I'm like holy fuck did this all happen to him that's what got me kind of looking into what his life was yeah. like uh, I don't think that ever happened to him Correct me if I'm wrong. I so from what I understand is that he existed kind of on the outskirts of a really hard world. Um, and I think and again, like if I'm wrong about that, please, you know, listeners, let me know. Um, but I think generally he was kind of seen as soft, 
you know, you look at somebody like a DMX that clearly lived that life, was about that life. And from what I understand, J. Cole never got himself too deeply involved in that. Not that he didn't have the access to it, but I think he's a very intelligent man. You know, yeah. there's no, there's absolutely no question about it. So I think from a very young age, he did not see the value in putting himself in those situations because he admits on this album throughout the whole thing that he never felt tougher than anybody. You know, he never felt like he was the biggest, baddest person. What he was good at was using his brain and, you know, being intelligent about things and clearly is a very, very good rapper. And I think that's people looked at him like, well, if you never lived that life, how do you talk about it? Like, how do you don't mean it? You're faking it. You know, and I think that was a big thing that people kind of hammered him for. But to me, it's like it's not as if he didn't ever experience those things like people that he loved experienced those things like people very close to him died mm -hmm. because they were involved in those things. So it's not as if he didn't have any basis of knowledge for this stuff. You know, he may not have ever gotten himself directly involved in it, but you know, that doesn't mean that he doesn't know what's going on and he doesn't have, and he's not qualified to, to rap about it and make art about it. You know, I think it's, you know, you want somebody as intelligent as him that understands why people are in those situations, doesn't look down on it. You know, he's like, it's, I wish people didn't have to do that, but he understands that the world is what it is. And especially for the folks that have to participate in those activities because they live in areas that have been totally forgotten about, um, whether it's by the government or, you know, regular affluent society. But, it, it, you know, he just always kind of got hammered for that, I think. And mm -hmm. and he also took a long time before he released his first album. You know, he was this up and coming artist that had features on other people's songs mm -hmm. and just took a very long time before he released his own debut album. And I think people were just like, well, he must not really be all that they say he is if he hasn't released an album yet. And so he had those expectations that he had to overcome. And, you know, six albums later, I think he has. I think he's looked at as, you know, on the level of like a Kendrick Lamar or somebody like that. That's kind of a luminary of modern hip hop right now. Yeah. And he, he is a really interesting guy. And I think with as many similarities as he shares with someone like Kendrick Lamar, he has just as many with someone like Donald Glover, because mm -hmm. there's this idea of the pretender and the authentic experience, right? Yeah. And he's got a white German mother and uh, an African-American father. And he obviously looks African-American. And he himself said, he was like, I know my white family. I love my white family. I acknowledge that I, I have mixed race heritage. And I love those people. And that's great. But I identify fully and strongly as black because... That's what the world is going to see, first of all, and it's mm -hmm. going to affect the way people treat you. So, you know, people can talk about, like, what's his credibility? Oh, he grew up in North Carolina, like you said, on the outskirts of some dangerous living. But at the end of the day, he was going to be taken care of and his needs were going to be met. He was really smart and upwardly mobile. Mm -hmm. So you can if people are going to question his credibility along those lines it's like well the one thing you have to remember is that he's still a black man in america and mm -hmm. that's another theme that comes up a lot on this album and it begets a lot of questions and stories from his personal life and the rap industry which we'll continue to get into but yeah. he's a really fascinating guy he's really hard to put into a fucking box yeah, and he's, I, I mean, I don't think, you know, and I compared him to Kendrick Lamar, who is, I mean, of any modern day rapper, you know, I think he is the best one there is. You know, I think there's, you know, Good Kid, Mad City, you know, I think is one of the best albums of the last decade. I mean, it's just incredible top to bottom. And it he's so capable of writing these songs and changing up his, his flow and changing up how he does, does his songs that, you know, he doesn't need a lot of extra production, you know, he's got some really great musicality on his albums but he is his own voice you know he is powerful enough on his own and jay cole's right there with him you know especially after listening to this album and not having been that familiar with him before you know i'm really sad i missed out on him because you know fiance of the pod marla has been a big jay cole fan for a long time like she's the one that kind of brought it to light to to do this album and i think it being such a big album anyway we probably would have ended up on it regardless but 
you know, she, I think sent us on the Instagram. She didn't even say it in person. She was like, I'm going to make sure Alex sees this too. <laughs> and then you have to do it. Uh, but she's been a big J Cole fan for a while. So that's how I've heard him is just like when she's played him, but not actively going out and finding him myself. And I was just unbelievably impressed throughout this entire album at his ability to deliver stories, his ability to rhyme intelligently and have, you know, use words that are not typical in hip hop, you know, and, and make it his own, you know, and not sound inauthentic in any way, shape or form. Yeah, definitely. It's like you said, nothing I had, I had no experience with J Cole prior to this. And I definitely want to go back and see what else is there because this, this was, I would say Kendrick Lamar for me takes more chances with the sound and with mm -hmm. the production. I think some of the J Cole stuff, especially punching the clock, felt a little familiar but there again when he is that succinct that expressive and that good at formatting the rhymes the way he would do it you know what i mean it's not something anybody could jump in and do um it, it's it was just really really enjoyable to listen to in spite of the fact that every now and then i was like you know it's that's a beat i'm familiar with but like who gives a yeah. shit everything else is is there and did you notice as well that he does not use like song structure like at other all people do like at all like he'll he has several songs where there's just no chorus it's yeah. just two big verses like and like dmx did that with keep your shit the hardest he just had like one chorus in it and then it was just four other four minutes straight of him just rapping that is the style that i kind of thought j cole was doing where it's like where is he gonna stop he just has so much to say constantly and it's all so interesting that structure songs like he does you don't realize that he doesn't do it like it's a pop song you know he doesn't do it with the a b a b or like a b chorus a b chorus like he doesn't do it with those structures for the most part because he doesn't have to he's good enough as a rapper that it's his verses that you're there to hear like you don't care about the choruses and when he does those they're still interesting he weaves those in better than most anybody you know it's it's really he's a very very interesting artist and i think deserves every bit of praise that he gets i mean it's it's really really good stuff yeah and he's been working on this shit since he was 12 his mom bought him a mixer and he was just off to the races from there and that it, you know it shows it shows that like a lot of thought went into how these things are laid out and and almost to the point where you feel like it's intentional avoiding mm -hmm. structure because that might cheapen it you know what i mean i it's yeah. definitely way more interesting stuff gets repeated here and there but like every song is unpredictable and that was mm -hmm. a really cool listening experience yeah absolutely and the next one uh was one that you had also picked pride is the devil with little baby so <clears throat> this is an interesting one again we were talking about in the context of the rap industry because this is essentially a song that is about pride and posturing and what and pride is really tied in with respect you want to be respected you want to give the appearance of respect your respect and your dignity are really the only things people can't take away from you in a world where it can take pretty much anything else so the song is really kind of diving into this idea that pride will fuck you up it'll trip you up if that's entirely where you're invested so he gives specific examples in the song where you know aunts and uncles are too proud to say they're sorry and stand by your convictions and, and look like someone who doesn't take any shit and that's in theory a fine thing but in practice can be really fucking deadly and he points out pride got a lot of people i knew and love killed mm -hmm. Um, so I, it's, it's an interesting jumping off point for a larger discussion, but I want to hear what you thought about it first. Yeah. So I, you know, I think this was where I kind of went into it more where it's like, he's looked at as soft because he says things like this, where it's like, there's a lot of people that pride is all there is like, don't, don't ever question how much of a man I am. Don't question how tough I am because, you know, you know, I'm never going to back down. You know, and I think he looks at it like, I'm not going to win every fight. You know, he's like, it'd be stupid for me to think I'm something I'm not. You know, that to me is why he is so successful is because he has that vulnerability. But at no point does he ever seem like somebody that I would think is soft. You know, it's it's 
I guess somebody living in that lifestyle would look at someone like him and said and say like oh he doesn't have what it takes to live like this like I don't live in that lifestyle so I don't have that perspective so I look at it like this guy is just being very very honest with himself and with us about how he feels about those things like he's doesn't disrespect the people that are in that life I think it's more respectful of them for him to say I'm not capable of living like that, so I'm not going to try. I'm not going to claim that I do, because if he starts doing stuff like that, people are going to start trying to test that, and he's like, I don't even want to play that game. Well, and that's a great segue into what I kind of wanted to get into, which is image and celebrity beefs in the rap community, Mm -hmm. because he's a very unique – he's almost like a fucking professional hockey player. He's a very unique rap beefer. (laughs) Which sounds like weird. That's like a Taco Bell menu. <laughs> the new rap beefer. Um, but I- image is such a huge part of the rap game. And again, pride and image all tied together. And no one wants to get questioned or called out on their shit. And I think it's important to establish yourself, too. Um, I think it's why uh, some of the issues between like Nicki Minaj, Cardi B, Megan The Stallion, Doja Cat, like... Nicki Minaj just going after everybody. Mm -hmm. It's because like you have to fight and scrap for your corner of the genre and the business and the spotlight. And once you get it, you don't want to let something like that go. So I'm sure that I I can't say why anyone has a beef with anyone. I'm sure there's just as many instances of a beef that came from a specific um, slight. And there are some that maybe are kind of manufactured on the fly Mm -hmm to generate controversy and get your name out there. Nobody really means anything by it. So that's where I draw the analogy of like hockey players where it's like, Oh, it's Tilly time. You want to go? And they just kind of box each other around and they don't mean anything by it. It's not fucking personal. It's just something you get out there as part of the game. And like, I don't know. Have you read into any of the people that J Cole has kind of had buff with? No, I haven't. And I I did that specifically because I didn't want to find out that it was people that I really liked and have that paint the how I looked at this album because I listened to it through the first time and he definitely mentions a couple times like somebody came out with a double album and hardly sold anything. Um, I don't know who he's referencing for that, but he talks about it twice. So he really wanted to get that point across that whoever it is like clearly had talked some shit about J. Cole and he's like, oh, well, you had to put out a double album and it still wasn't that great and so there was that he talked about diddy how he had like a beef with him but then did then he has diddy on the song so i think he is a prideful rapper you know i think he's very much like don't question what i'm good at but he's a big enough man to be like i don't need to argue with everybody you know i don't need to hold on to these things these grudges if people are willing to meet me halfway i'll meet them there too you know and i think that's that's a really commendable thing when we've seen so much violence happen because of words, because of things that happen in rap songs. You know, we've seen tons of people push it way too far because neither one wanted to be take the, the high road and be the lesser man. Um, and it, it really, for someone like him, I think that's a great example for how to do it. You know, it can be a very competitive industry, but keep it in the words, you know, keep it there. Don't, don't let it spill out into affecting people's real lives and real livelihoods. You know, and I think he does a really good job with that. Well, and, and, and in a weird way, and this is why, again, I'm like a smart guy who starts shit with people in the rap community. But again, in very low stakes ways, part mm-hmm. of me goes crazy like a fox because he kind of winds up resolving everything very easily with these people and giving them exposure. So like no name. Are you familiar with no name? Mm -mm. female rapper uh super fucking talented kind of bowed out of rap because she felt like the black community wasn't coming out to support her and the white Mm -hmm. community was appropriating her music which were both totally valid criticisms yeah so she pivoted to activism and like she kind of went on a twitter tirade about capitalism at one point how there's no more viable alternative and a lot of people were like well we're going to take you to school and she did the work and she did the research and she's mm-hmm. she's committed herself to activism and j cole fucking dissed her in the song snow on the bluff it was basically okay. like she's got a queen tone 
and she's telling every she's treating adults like children and that's fucked up she figured out that she was being subtweeted there and she came back and was like what the fuck is this and j cole instead of like escalating it told his followers go check out no name follow her yeah see what she's doing and i think it's to your earlier point where it was like okay there are experiences i haven't had because of who i am and what i've been through you know a music prodigy and very intelligent Mm -hmm. and had opportunities that other people didn't get so he there are experiences that other people have and there are areas of expertise other people have that he doesn't so in a backwards way he brings exposure to himself and to no name by picking a fight with her quickly resolving it and then giving attention her way so that people can get the straight dope on activism Now, I'm sure everything that I just said is the equivalent of the Pepe Silva episode of Always Sunny, (laughs) where Charlie's got all the string on the walls. But it's it's definitely J. Cole is an interesting dichotomy, a guy who can back his shit up, but kind of seems to be floating above everything. Yeah. And and it's and, you know, I feel like he would hesitate to say he's floating above everything. I think he at his core, I think, is a peacemaker. You know, I think he's somebody that doesn't want he understands that there's a big enough pie for everybody you know and and if everybody's fighting over it you're gonna waste the pie you know and i think he that's his mindset is that you know we we've got room for everybody so we've got room for you to argue with somebody don't have to doesn't have to be all you know hugs and rainbows all the time you know you can be upset with what somebody said you can be upset with their viewpoints on things but leave it there you know leave it in the music and that's it you know don't let it spill out outside of that and like what he did with no name you know and i'd have i'll have to look into that um i remember seeing like a little bit of it on on twitter and stuff but i didn't really look into it that much because i again didn't really listen to a lot of j cole so none of it no part of that really like affected my life you know um so i didn't really look into it and you know it sounds like what he raps about on this album and what he talks about is very much in line with what you're saying how he handled that situation where it's like he might fly off the handle a little bit and start an argument, but he's man enough to understand when it's time to like back off and be like, okay, well I understand. I probably have a much bigger fan base that will tear this girl apart. And for the reasons that the reasons that she like left the industry and stopped participating as much, you know, is just going to reinforce that if I, release the hounds on her so i think he looked at that and was like i'm not interested in ruining someone's career i'm interested in finding a common place to to exist in with her and i think that's that's really great yeah and i also hope that no name she allegedly recorded another album and just hasn't released it yet so i hope she does decide to to grace us with that because i don't want to be a a part of the problem with the cultural appropriation thing but i think she was specifically referring to people that don't have that in mind and go to her shows and Mm -hmm. like white people who are acting black and not realizing that they're being offensive um whereas like i'm like goddamn she's just so fucking talented and smart and i i don't want to not enjoy that music i don't want to upset her but you know it's just really good music yeah i I think if you look at it as a learning experience you know which i think is is the point they're trying to express themselves in their experience and if you try to if you take that in as how they're presenting it and being like oh i never looked at it that way but now i have a different point of view because of the way it's been presented to me then i think that's the goal you know i don't think anybody should be well i guess i can't really say that. i you know i think there's i think the idea is that you don't just enjoy her music and then you know whatever issues there were you just leave them at the door and go on with your life you know i think that's i think if you accept what the message they're trying to bring in and it helps change your point of view or or form your point of view to understand where they're coming from i think that's a much different version that's certainly not what she's talking about when she's talking about appropriating her music i think that's a good reason for her to make the music is for people like us to understand a little better where they're coming from and you know i think she's perfectly valid in the pe- in criticizing the folks that were appropriating it and not really understanding her message and just trying to enjoy it because it was the cool thing to do you know i think that's i think that's perfectly fair yeah and and 
to be clear, speak to people on their level, right? And I mm -hmm. am a, a, a music and film enthusiast, and that's where I do the most of my thinking is through those two media. Like, I, I music and film are the way to reach me. So I feel like, exactly to your point, if you can educate people any way you can and share your experience any way you can, it's it's a victory if you're getting people to consider the things the issues that you're talking about yeah so you know it's not like oh i'm trying to get away with saying slurs in my room while i wrap around with it it's not that kind of thing <laughs> yeah it's just i really appreciate the music i appreciate the insight i appreciate what she's trying to share and it sucks that a bunch of dingbats had to go and fucking ruin it for everybody yeah, well, hopefully, hopefully she comes back and releases more music because I'd be interested to hear. And maybe J Cole like does a song with her or something. Maybe they like officially fully bury the hatchet. You know, I think that'd be pretty cool. She may be holding on to this a little bit. Who knows? But it, it sure seemed like she was like, "Uh, uh you said it. You're going to explain yourself." Yeah. So yeah. who knows? But wouldn't that I'd be, be interested nice? to see how that goes? Yeah. Um. So the next song we gotta. Yeah, I feel realize we're we're going to be running up against time here so i think we have just enough time to get through these last two yeah um the one that i chose the first one let go my hand um so this one is one he did with bass and i don't know if it's just pronounced black or six black i don't know but it's pr it's spelled the number six l-a-c-k so when you look at it like the number six looks kind of like a b so i'll have to brush up on that and maybe maybe one of the listeners can can kind of clarify on that uh, but it's one of those things, like I was saying, he's a very confessional rapper. And this song is a very, very confessional song. And he talks about Islam. You know, he talks about how his a friend of his introduced him to the Quran. And, you know, he thought it was really, really interesting. But he didn't have the the ability to pay attention enough to really, like, dive into it. So it's it's very much like talking about his shortcomings as a human being and not being able to pay enough attention and like not having the like will to really dive into it, but appreciating another culture, you know, and understanding that, well, there's some, there's a lot of value there. And, you know, I recognize that I might not have the ability to take the time to really fully look into it right now. But, you know, I think that's the reason I think I like him so much is because he doesn't try to posture too much. Like he's very confident in what he does. Like he knows he's very good at what he does. He's not, trying to play the mouse or anything like that he is very confident in what he does but he's also i think it takes a really confident person to admit when they aren't well versed in something and i think he's always willing to do that at least on this album and it's really i don't know it's a really refreshing form of rap you know and i think there's so so many versions of of rap that you're perfectly welcome to enjoy but i happen to really enjoy this one yeah and i think Pursuant to the Islam part of it, it begets an interesting line of thought, which is if you achieve the level of success that J. Cole has, I feel like on some level you have to consider, like, why me? Obviously, mm -hmm. you're talented, but where did that come from? And also, plenty of talented people don't make anything of themselves. So, like, why, mm -hmm. you know, why you? Why me? Why am I in this position? And in trying to understand something like that, it would be perfectly natural for someone to dip a toe into religion if it was mm -hmm. presented. So, you know, again, I think because he's a he's a he's a heady guy that that might occur to him a couple of times. Like, well, even if I don't buy wholesale into the religion, there's got to be some insight in here and you, you can never learn too much. You can never grow too much, mm -hmm. um, especially in the context of what he's up against because the song he talks about like yes i've had success and it was a crazy road to get here and now here i am a father and i'm father to a, a black son in america and there are going to be a lot of people that try to test him and here i am asking questions about why me why am i in this position will my kid be as lucky what's he going to do when he's out on his on his own and then it's the title of the song, Let Go My Hand. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a, a certain extent to which you can protect your children and shelter them from the world. And then they have to go out and they have to learn. And yeah. and it's a scary proposition from what it sounds like to J. Cole to release any child into an unforgiving world. But especially with the what's going on in our country right now, 
to release a, a young black man out into the into society and yeah. hope that he's able to navigate the pitfalls of that. So yeah. again, it's like very thoughtful and to the no name thing where we talk about like she's sharing insight and experience with her music. It's what he does here. That's not something like you or I are ever going to have to think about potentially kids like, Oh gee, I hope they do okay at college halfway yeah. across the country, but we probably don't have to worry about cops abusing them, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's also, there's another layer to, having a son as a famous dad mm -hmm. you know that son is going to have whatever he decides to do and he might end up being just as talented whether it's in music or you know whatever else whatever whatever discipline he decides to go into you know academics or or sports or writing you know whatever whatever he decides to go into and, and children of creative celebrities tend to be creatives themselves you know but I think there's that added pressure that it's like, did they really make it on their own or did they only make it because of who their parents are? You know, and there's tons of examples in the world of that right now. You know, you look at like Will Smith and, and Jada Pinkett Smith's kids. Would they be famous if they didn't have famous parents? You look at like Kate Hudson. Would she be a famous actress if her parents weren't Kurt Russell and Goldie Hawn? You know, you, there's tons of examples of this stuff and there's like plenty that are just as talented you know there's plenty in like you know i'm sure kate hudson has some good movies i haven't seen them um and i'm sure what uh J will smith's kids have some good songs i just haven't listened to them um but it's like how much did they really achieve on their own versus their parents doing it so you know he's also acknowledging there's going to be that pressure that people are going to test him because he's the one with the famous dad you know and it's like people are going to use that as a taunt i'm sure it's like you don't deserve this you know, it's only because your dad is famous that you're even here. Like, that's got to be tough to hear. It's like being the coach's son on a team. Like, people think that's the only reason you're getting playing time. You know, it's like that same yeah. idea. And so not only is his son going to be black in a country that right now is not a great place. And, and I mean, I say right now has never been a great place for black people to exist. And he's also going to have all that pressure to deal with as well. And I think it's it's a really... You know, it's kind of an interesting thing to to think about. You know, it's a perspective that I can't really wrap my mind around. So I'm glad when J. Cole makes a song like this and I'm able to understand that perspective a little more from somebody that has to deal with it directly. Yeah. And again, to your point about the like his son growing up, the child of a rich, influential celebrity, it again raises that question of authenticity, right? Like well, you never experienced poverty and you never experienced what like, you know, people in an economically depressed neighborhood in New York City mm -hmm. have had to go through or something like that. And that's a lot of pressure. And I want to be clear too, where whenever we talk, we reference like the, the sordid history of this country with race relations, or we talk about the current state of them. And we say things like, it's never been good to be a black person in this country. One thing I want to make super clear is like, we're not trying to speak for anybody. Yeah. We're, we're, we're taking jump shots at a tough issue. And I, I think there is a, a, a possibility sometimes when you are trying to acknowledge people's suffering that you inadvertently can offend them. And they're like, you know, I've had a good life and I've done fairly well. Yeah. I don't like you telling me that it sucks to be me and I'm not valued in this country. So I just do want to make that caveat where it's like yeah. we're not we're not trying to distill the black experience to one thing, especially as two white guys. So I, I think, again, kind of the thesis of the album for us has been we can learn a lot from one guy and what his experience is. Yeah. And everything is kind of a roll of the dice. So you don't know what your experience will be like. You could have a famous dad and you could end up on Skid Row you could come from nothing and build an empire. And and that's a really interesting line of thought. And so pursuant to that, while we're acknowledging issues that get brought up in the album, I don't want to sit here and prattle on about like, well, the black experience in America, like I know a fuck of what that's <laughs> about. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you know, I think it's just like you said, it's just trying to get different perspectives in, in its albums like this that I think help us along our journey to to understanding that stuff a little better. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Um, and the last song we're going to go over um, is Interlude. And this one I picked because he did release it as a single. It's like two minutes long, like just over two minutes long or something like that. There's no chorus. Takes a while before he gets even into a verse. Mm-hmm. So this is J. Cole at his kind of weirdest. You know, this is, I think, why I find him so interesting is because he, one, wasn't going to release any singles. And the one that he did is this one where it's got a really, really great verse, but it's it's not a classic pop song. It's not a classically constructed rap song either. You know, there's like there's a lot about it that's just really unconventional. And I think that sums him up as well. Like he's a pretty unconventional guy. Like he does, you know, conventional he does a conventional style of music, but I think he has a lot more to offer and it's songs like this that kind of tell you that where he just is he can rap about tech nines and he can rap about how his son is going to have a tough experience and he can rap and he can do things like have an intelligent conversation and debate with no name you know and he can have a beef with diddy and then bury it you know it's just like a very very varied life that this guy has led and it's songs like this that you know really kind of stick out to me as like okay well you know, he's a weirdo. I like weirdos. And if he's going to release a song like this, like that just goes to show that he doesn't really care that much about what people think of him, but he's just going to put this out because he knows it's still good enough. I fucking love that he did this one as the single. Yeah. Cause like you said, it's short. It's almost, it's like borderline stream of consciousness. Mm-hmm. But what I love about it is this is an album. He chose to break a bunch of his Cardinal rules. He usually never has people feature, on any of his tracks, he mm-hmm. did that here. He usually releases the album as a whole. He doesn't do singles. He did that here. And then he picks, like, the weirdest choice in the bunch, but probably my favorite song on the album. It's just, like, yeah. the, the intensity, the wordplay, the structure, the stream of consciousness. It's all kind of just a really a really interesting song. Well, folks, we had some audio technical difficulties so i don't know what uh what was the last part that you heard there but um that was the last song we were going over was interlude um we were just kind of talking about how clever some of the wordplay was and i'm gonna go ahead and say this album j cole the off season stream it i agree stream it i plan on going back and listening to more j cole so yeah dig into this one yeah, absolutely. It was it was really, really good. I think he's a really talented guy. I'm excited to see what else he's got. Um, so by the time you listen to this on Monday, folks, there's going to be another singles episode out from Alex. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't know if he wants to spoil it if you haven't heard it yet. Uh, but go ahead and go to our YouTube. You'll find us by searching hashtag out on that line, you'll find all of our singles videos that way, as well as all of our regular episodes. We like to upload those. So if that's your preferred medium for listening to podcasts or any audio at all, it's all there on YouTube. So you can find that. Don't forget to subscribe. You'll also find us on Instagram. You'll also find us on Twitter at out on that line and at out on that line one, respectively. You'll find us on Facebook and wherever you like to listen to podcasts. So Alex, is there anything else? that you wanted to go over this week. I can't think of a single goddamn thing. Let's get out of here. All right. Until next time. 